Hey, everybody, we're back. Thank you very much uh, to the Source Point people, and welcome to a really fun uh, panel that we're about to do. Uh, I'm always happy to uh, talk to this guy. It's John Suntress here from the Word Balloon Podcast, and really happy to be part of Baltimore Comic Con. I just wrapped things up at Miller's Pub, but uh, I didn't have to drive to the next uh, panel, thank God. Uh, we are going to talk to, it's funny, I was just talking to a former Superman uh, writer, and now I'm going to be talking to a future Superman writer. Future is the operative word. Let's welcome uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson to uh, Baltimore Comic Con. It's good to see you, Philip. How are you? John Santris, that was good to see you, sir. Absolutely, man. Uh, very excited about what uh, is happening in uh, Future State, a, a new DC event that is coming early in 2021. And uh, you're handling, um, are you handling all of the Superman things or are you just uh, part of the uh, picture there? Not quite. There's a, um, there's going to be a, it's a very new scene starting. You know, as, as you've seen, there's going to be stuff that follows Clark Kent, of course. There's going to be stuff that follows John Kent as well. There's going to be um, a lot of a lot of supporting cast bits as well. As uh, I'm covering a story called Superman: Worlds of War that follows uh, our man Clark Kent in a in a new status quo, and another story called House of L that follows the Descendants uh, in about a thousand years. And I'm it's crazy stuff for that one too. That's very new territory. That's exciting, and I don't want you to spoil. But uh, we've already seen in previous iterations that. Given Superman's power level, you know, is he immortal? I mean, we all remember DC 1 million, uh, and we saw very old Superman still very much part of the DC universe. So I, I, I don't want you to spoil, but maybe we'll see what uh, Clark Kent might be doing a thousand years from now. Yeah, I, I hate to spoil it, but it's, I will say that it's not about, it's not just about him in the future. It's about, uh, about the, the pantheon, as it were, you know, like the, uh, what happens to his, his lineage, you know? And I will uh, say, I can, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that to talk about the the take at least uh, the take that I've that I've uh, that I'm a, that I'm doing on House of L is um, I approach it kind of like a, a Camelot story you know like I want it to be where we see um, like this this epic house far into the future what we've seen at, at, at the end of this golden age you know and I I want it to have, have this larger than life epic kind of quality where it's not just about King Arthur anymore it's about you know, the round table. So it's, it's that kind of thing. Understood. Yeah. The, well, the legacy, absolutely, man. Exactly. That's, the legacy. That's exciting. That's fantastic. And truly, Philip, I've really been thrilled reading your stuff and watching you grow at DC and the opportunities they're getting you and in Marvel as well. I, I really want to open this up and up and not just talk about DC. Yeah. Whatever you, you got, want to talk about. You got some cool stuff happening in Marvel. Are you still, you're still in the midst of your Marvel zombie arc, right? I am, yeah. The last issue of the miniseries, Marvel Zombies Resurrection, comes out on November 11th. We're super, super stoked how that all turned out. Um, that came together right around the same time that Kirkman was, like, dropped the announcement, hey, Walking Dead is over, <laughs> like, like, out of the blue. Um, that's when they announced, we want to do a Marvel Zombies reboot. And so we got to do that that prelude issue a year ago. That opened us up to do the mini series that just that happened got pushed back a bit because of COVID, but now that's finally going to wrap up, and we're really excited for people to see the ending. Um, would love to do more of that story if we wanted to, but yeah, that actually turned into another story. So, Marvel Zombies turned out great, and we were looking for more opportunities to do something else. Um, and they, over the course of that series, they learned what a huge you know horror fan that I am, and that led to. Um, this new dream come true property um, that I'm going to be working on now. And they gave me the big announcement is coming like next week, I think. Um, so they want to, they want to wait for the big announcement, but um, they did green light me to, to let people know that um, I'm going to be writing an all new ongoing horror series at Marvel starting in February. And I am, insanely excited about it um so keep your eye on the internet next week and there'll be a big announcement that's outstanding man that's fantastic to hear and right now you know again we're dealing with marvel zombies um it is a, like you said it's a reboot it's a serious it's more of a serious story than i think what robert and uh, arthur soydam and um i'm forgetting who else was involved in the uh, marvel zombies back in the day when yeah sean phillips out. drew the original right i think wow that's insane you're right isn't that amazing I honestly think so, yeah. What was, guys were doing back then? I know. Yeah, it's cool. Like now, I've got I've got literally everything that dude ever did with with Brubaker, and I love his work. 
but it's so crazy to see him in the context of that story. If you go back and read it now, I'm like, holy crap, it's the fatal guy, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was such a different take. I mean, that was that was the first time we'd seen. Well, I guess I, I can't I can't speak with authority and say it's the first time we've ever seen Marvel characters as zombies. But it was that was like the that was the uh, um, novelty, you know, just to see yeah. all the heroes. At, just you know, it's just a romp. I think Miller. I think Miller in Ultimate Fantastic Four. Uh, well, yes, that's been, what I mean. Yeah, lead, yeah, lead, leading into that series. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. so yeah, it was a. You know, super cool take. It was just very different than yeah. we wanted to do. We wanted wanted to take a more like show something with more emotional stakes and that takes us up more seriously. Just a different uh, different version of it, and it went. I was really pleased with how it turned out. Um, so yeah, and that led into this thing that we're doing next. Are you staying away from deceased as Tom Taylor is doing kind of another apocalyptic kind of story over there? Honestly, when they when they when they approached me about it. Um, Obviously, that was the first thing that kept popped in my mind. I was like, oh, okay, so the cease is already happening. And the, the first couple issues had already happened by then. Um, and I had already bought them by the time that that uh, they approached me. And honestly, I I did – I wanted to read them. because, Like, I know some people probably would have avoided it because um, they could be careful not to copy it. And I went the other way. Like, I was I was sure to stay on top of what Tom was doing um, because I didn't want to accidentally crib. You know, like, it's – sure. You know, everybody's influenced by the same stuff and everyone knows the same, you know, movies and books. And I don't, I want to be careful not to accidentally tread in the same, uh, same footsteps as Tom. Tom's a friend now at the time. I didn't know him, but, um, but I was already a big admirer of his work on Injustice and, and on Deceased. I thought Deceased was a really just a kick-ass take on what you could do with a superhero zombie book. Um, and thankfully the stuff that I had in mind that I had planned for, for resurrection did not really cover any of the same ground. I mean, it was the vibe is kind of similar sure. um, in that you're, you know, in its vaguest sense, because you want every death to count. You want all the, the wins and losses to really hit hard. Um, and they do in deceased. I, th I thought that was very effective, but um, I, I did want to keep a little bit of, I wanted it to be fun still too. Um, not, not in a jokey way like the original was, but visually, I guess. I guess most most of the fun that I brought to it was was done in um, like I guess it's not too bad a spoiler to talk about the first issue. Um, Forge is in it, and he, you know, by the time we see the characters, he has taken the bodies of his fallen comrades of like his, like other mutants and and built bio weapons that you can that he can use against you know against the zombie horde and so you're seeing like the top half of cyclops's head wired into a, a rifle that you can use like a laser cannon and stuff like that that's just like fun visuals sure and seeing nightcrawler bamfing around like it's just half of him and stuff like that it's just kind of like oh wow can fun to see even though it's yeah. like obviously super super serious content absolutely um, man. that keeps it from being like a just a Bummer. Just, just a total downer the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> at least you're seeing. I want readers to ask the question. I wonder what the X Mansion would look like, or like I wonder what would have happened with, um, you know, Shield, or what, you know, just uh, Phalanx. You know, you wanted to see, so you, you're getting your questions answered in visually very fun ways, even while you know the tone is very dour. <laughs> you know, absolutely, man. No, it's honestly between the two companies, it sounds like you know you're getting getting great opportunities. Uh, in both universes, and I think that's incredible. And uh, also, I mean, goddamn, I've enjoyed uh, reading your uh, your 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 fantasy stuff as well that you were doing. Oh, thank you, absolutely. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't Vertigo. It was, uh, and, and forgive me right now. It's it's Saturday morning, and I'm, I'm I've got a million panels in my. It's head. totally fine. Last God, yeah. Last it's God. DC, Last me. God is DC Black Label. Um, yes. And and when we first started talking about that book before it actually got made, it was going to be Vertigo. Like I can, I guess I can say that now, not get in trouble. <laughs> it was a long time ago before, um, you know, before the Vertigo shakeup and all that. Um, and Black Label at the time, they were trying to find, you know, its its identity was mainly going to be as a like a superhero line, just a darker sure. take. And Last God felt like a better fit for Vertigo at the, at the time, but it was still a great fit for Black Label when. Uh, the the identity kind of changed, um, so yeah, it became a black label book, and it's still still over there. It'll be 
it, it's still on shelves through uh, January. Forgive me, either January or February. The last issue will be coming out. Okay, okay, that's cool. So, yeah. Good response. Have you been? Have you been pleased? Oh with my god, response? yes. It's that's been great, a man. Trip. Yeah, the sales have been great, and like, but I mean, reader readership and the reader response has been awesome. Um, mostly because I think they can see just the unthinkable amount of hours I put into it, like the 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 uh, all the back matter and the world building that I put into it. There's like, you know, I've got you know, glossaries of, you know, thousands of words of different languages and songs and, you know, religious texts and stuff that make their way into the book. Um, and fans, like there's a lot of deep dive D and D fans that read this thing that are so into it. And it's incredibly rewarding to see that. So I, I'm always nerding out with fans online about um, just questions about characters or about aspects of, of the world building that they like to talk about. And it's been awesome, especially that's when they, excellent. we've got that source book where people can make their own campaigns and Dungeons and Dragons. Now um, their own tabletop adventures using that, using that world. And sometimes people will reach out about that. It's just been the best. That's excellent, man. And again, um, I have a feeling that as your uh, DC and Marvel stuff evolves, people will reach back and uh, look at last God. And I think uh, kind of in, and although um, in the case of Tom King, Omega man was a uh, already a recognizable property, yeah. you know, I mean now, you know, again, I think that wasn't a big seller. I mean, I'm glad to hear that sales were good for you, but I do think that as uh, your profile expands, uh, they're going to, they're going to reach back for last God. I think that's. Well, awesome. Thank you. I hope so. I'm very proud of it. And that's, I mean, last God was in part, I think what, um, what asked what uh, inspired them to reach out to me about the Superman thing because it's like they're like there's this guy who spends ten times too long writing the stories and does all this all this back back matter and like he loves to world build is basically I think basically I got the call to do um, Superman um, the Worlds of War stuff and also the Marvel Zombies Resurrection um, in part on the strength of just this guy loves to world build. And they they wanted to to do that on both those properties between uh, between Last God and a book I did at Boom before that Warlords of Appalachia. Um, I think that showed them that I'm willing to do like really deep dives on stuff, and that's been a nice thing. That's excellent, man, and that's that's fantastic to hear, Philip. You've you've had a very interesting path to comics, and uh, I, I really your your other jobs. Uh, fascinated me when we had our first conversation. I, I don't mind if you, if you don't mind. I'd, I'd love for you to, to talk about uh, your 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 other jobs. You're you're not oh, sure. you, you put a lot of time in those other jobs. But yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah, sure. I actually i i came to um, i came to comics through music. Actually, i i back in the day, like so many writers, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a comic artist, um, and I drew a lot as a kid. But I also played music very seriously. Um, and ended up going the other way and went uh, chasing music as a, as a profession. And, um, I love, com I learned how to read, literally taught myself how to read off of comics. Um, and I read comics all the way through high school and, um, briefly in college. And then I kind of gave up all, um, all in enjoyable reading <laughs> for, for years. Um, so I didn't really pick up a book for a long time for a comic, at least, um, did, uh, did undergrad, grad school, joined the Glenn Miller Band, and all that time I wasn't really reading comics. Um, and then my younger brother, Bill, who uh, was also a trumpet player, and, sorry, I play trumpet for anyone who doesn't know. And um, so I was playing in the Miller Band and then got out and did, uh, I joined the Army Field Band, one of the premier bands in Washington, DC. That's what I'm still doing now. And my younger brother also played trumpet and drew and he ended up going the other way. He wanted to be an artist. Uh, excuse me. Ah. No worries, buddy. No. I know. Great <laughs> season. Yeah. Um, he decided to to pursue art. He was a better artist than I ever was and really wanted to do it. So, But he didn't really – both of us kind of grew up in the sticks, out in, in, in the deepest Kentucky, and he didn't really know where to go next. Um we didn't really have the internet where we were like, it's um, not to say it wasn't available, but our situation was just, we didn't have a lot of contact with the, the comic scene. Um, never been to a convention. He didn't really know how to get started. And um, I was like, by the time I was already in the DC area, I was like, well, let's just, just come live with me and we'll figure it out. Like, we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll educate myself on how comics work, how, how comics are made. I still, 
I mean, in theory, I still love to write. Like, I'll, I just haven't been doing it because I've been so busy. So I'll just I'll put together some scripts for you so you can have something in a portfolio that's not just pinups. And so we start going to conventions together and uh, working out together and just hanging out and, and reading. I, I got I found a comic store around here. I, at the time, a brand new shop in Annapolis called Third Eye Comics, which is at the time just this little hole in the wall place. And now is this, you know, crazy phenom store but at the time it was really small and uh just figured out what the what the state of the art was now how far it would come like i mean last time i was reading comics regularly i was i was a monthly subscriber to wolverine with adam kubert and i think larry hama at the time if i remember right wow the, that's great at the time i wasn't even reading the names you know i didn't know any of these people sure um i just remember like how awesome it looked and i really liked the way um, I really love Wolverine's depiction in the in the uh, stories. I was I was subscribing to that. And I was subscribing to Batman. This is coming out of Nightfall and Night's End, um, and I was reading some like Mullet Superman and that kind of thing because I I always love Superman. Sure. Um, Joe Mad X Men, and now I so I go back to the store. You know, fast forward until now, and I'm I'm picking stuff up. This is probably ten years ago. And now I'm seeing like the boys and American Vampire and Lock and Key and Astonishing X Men that Joss Whedon did with John Cassidy and I was like, holy shit, man! Everything has come so far. And like yeah. Preacher, I mean, I know Preacher was out before that, but sure. I I didn't know about it. You know, I I just knew about the the big two stuff that was the yeah. most popular thing stuff that you could get at Walmart was all I was really reading. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, I was just immediately just blown away by how great everything was now. Um, and I just got the got the bug hardcore. So I started writing like crazy, did some stuff for my brother to draw just to kind of give him a leg up on his career, you know. Um, and then he joined the army and as an illustrator and kind of got busy. And I started I kept going to conventions and started looking for other other artists to work with. And that led to Last Sons of America. And I kind of got my foot in. That's awesome. What does your brother do illustration wise for the army? Well, he he did six years and got out. He he joined as a let's see what's the the MOS code twenty three something. I can't, remember, I can't remember the code, but it's a the name of the job is multimedia illustrator, and that's a whole like series of gigs you can do where you're just uh, technically you just draw and design graphic things that they need like educational materials, any kind of pamphlet, any kind of program, any kind of brochure. Um, photo they also do photography is its own thing in the army as well, but they also do photographs sometimes. There is some like some crossover. Okay. Is <clears throat> um, is is the magazine are you aware of um, you know, Will Eisner developed this magazine for the army, PS, and I don't know if it's still in existence or not. I know that when Will Eisner was done with it, Joe Kubert had taken over. I know. I know that so, Joe yeah. Kubert there's a there's a drawing in my building. Um, I don't think I'm not sure if it's from the magazine, but there's a picture that I'm pretty sure Kubert did um, of a guy, like a guy drinking coffee, and it's like everybody gets their share or something. Like it's in this old illustration that he did, and you know everybody else just blows right past that in the hallway. But I'm like every time I go by there, I want to like kind of scratch it for luck. You know, it's just so cool to see a thing that Joe Kubert did, just some random army poster that's still getting used. You know. That's awesome, man. That's amazing. No, and I do. I love how this comics and the military relationship began. And I think it's amazing. Well, and really, shame on me. I mean, God. Uh, and and Bill, I want to say Bill Maudlin, the great uh, illustrator that did Willie and Joe, those amazing World War II uh, one-panel comics. I don't know if you're aware of <laughs> John, you're awesome, man. I wish I knew as much as you. That's so cool. I I don't know. I don't know who you're talking about. It's, I wish I did. I, 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 seriously, Phil, don't worry. Twenty years from now, you'll 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 get twenty years more. I, I hope mean, so. I, come on, man. It's all, a, all those age, but when, I, I when, when I read when I was reading back in the day, I was never looking at names, and I didn't know anything, and I was just like, "Hey, Wolverine's cool." And now I <laughs> and then I and then I gave up reading that stuff, and then I got back into. It. I feel like I'm still trying to keep up with everyone who knows so much. I am. Um, slowly educate myself even now like i've i'm very grateful for the success i've had recently but i still have so much to learn no it's all good man that's i'm sorry forgive me but i i appreciate the compliment but yeah seriously at the end of the day it's like hey i'm in my 50s all right what, what can i say and i just am I'm, i i just love how 
the world, you know, and then how comics happen all over the world. And it really isn't just all about the big two and what they do. And really, man, I'll tell you again, as we're doing these conventions online, I miss San Diego because there's always this great academic stream of panels that are literally happening in these rooms oh that you, you wouldn't know about. And I know. I, and, and again, another military-based comic. And I don't remember the creator, but I do know that it was an hour about this comic that was made for Japan post-World War II to normalize relations again between the U.S. and Japan after the oh, war. Wow. And it was fascinating. It was this amazing. And literally, man, 12 people in the room. Me, Rob Salkowitz, and maybe 10 academics. And that sure. was it. But Just that's it. Great, yeah, and truly... I have all these friends, too, in the academic world who kind of scan uh, whatever academics are working on various papers about these little nooks and crannies of the comic world that, again, uh, just don't wind up on the spinner rack. So it's I, I'm, I'm always I, I'm an open mind. And again, back to your career. Uh, love the fact that you were doing this uh, stuff playing, you know, in the in the military band and everything. And also with the Glenn Miller band. That's amazing. You gotta Thanks. be you gotta be a great trumpeter to do both of those gigs. That's outstanding. You're not Thanks. you ain't blowing bullshit here, man. I try not to screw around. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good gig. We're, and, it, and in our previous conversation, you were telling me too that um you came up with uh, a soundtrack for for Last God. I did, yeah. There's a um there's a lot of music in the story. Like the way Tolkien uh, th you know, Tolkien's whole world, you know, Middle Earth, all came out of his creation of languages in World War One, right? So he um, he just made up these. He was a student of language <clears throat> and of English specifically, and and not just modern English, but you know, Anglo-Saxon. And he he came up with his own languages, and that's how the whole. He eventually wrote the story around that, you know. With me, like if, if his if his way in was was language, my way into the Last God and the Fellspire Chronicles, the series that could potentially be there for years one more, is all um, music. I feel like his. I was always very taken with Tolkien, the way that he created um, stories within his stories, where his um, each each novel that he did had little folk tales and songs and rhymes and riddles and all those things just made the whole world seem much more everything seems so much older and more real and rich because of all the culture that he put into it and um i really admired those songs and i wanted to do my own and there are little recordings that you can find of of him singing his own stuff just just him into a you know recording. really yeah i mean not uh, not in a way that was meant to be consumed like real music i don't think but as a reference like there's you know I, I don't know if it was on i don't know what kind of technology he was using to record it if you're just doing it into somebody's little voice recorder or what but but yeah you can find recordings of him singing a couple of those songs um and it's so cool man i just it's like you're seeing history being made you know yeah so yeah and i am um, so I wrote these songs to put into Last God. I wanted to put one into every single issue. There were a couple issues where it didn't, um, it was feeling a little shoehorned in, so I didn't always put one in every single issue. But um, <clears throat> in most of the issues, there's a original song in there, sometimes from different cultures within the world and all that to show the differences, to illustrate differences between the cultures, but also uh, the the lyrics often will have little hints about the about events that led to the story too. That's so, yeah, yeah, it's a way a way to kind of cheat in some world building without without uh, exposition, you know. And that was the yeah. same thing with the uh, Warlords of Appalachia for Boom Studios. I had a lot of, I wrote a lot of mountain music for that book. And again, the lyrics were like little little cheats to to give, uh, you know, a little glimpse behind the curtain. That's excellent, Philip. Honestly, and I was just talking to Dave Gibbons <laughs> earlier this week about his uh, his Vertigo book, the originals. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a tribute to his days in the early '60s, uh, being a mod. And if you know, right. the mod, you know, the mods were the scooter guys that were. Right. Like, yeah, we spoke about that a little before, I think. Yes, I'm I, sure we did. And I, I, I forgive me, I'm, I'm bringing it up for. Oh, uh, no, no, that's not. Yeah, that's, for the that's audience, really cool. as much as for us and everything. No, and literally, yeah, it was. You know, I, I always bugged him about like, gotta put up a playlist, man, of mods. Oh, no. Yeah, so I love that. I mean, truly, this is this is what's exciting about this era of comics that there are these kinds of opportunities 
as as mundane as even just creating a list on you know playlist on Spotify or something. These are the songs that that inspired the story to actually creating original music. I just think the opportunities are amazing, and that's why it's great to have somebody like yourself that actually can go beyond cherry picking some music and and then you know playing songs, but but to really create your own music like that. That's outstanding. That's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, it's a fun perk. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, a, it's something that I know not everyone does in their work, so it's something that I try to try to embrace and try to let it, you know, give my give my um, my work a little bit more of a voice, you know. That's outstanding. Tell me about the Appalachia uh, uh, book more, the Boom book. Oh, Warlords of Appalachia! Yeah, I'm very proud of that one. It's um, Warlords of Appalachia that came out in twenty well October 2016, <laughs> like right right before the last election, and the uh, oh wow, it takes place. Um, after the second American Civil War and Kentucky has become an occupied nation within U.S. borders. So it's like the another civil war has happened. The uh, secessionists have lost again, but Kentucky did not acknowledge U.S. sovereignty even after that. So it becomes like the Afghanistan, the American South. Wow. And is occupied by the U.S. military within U.S. borders. Um, we follow a, a former Kentucky National Guardsman who is, you know, by that point, you know, those are the traitors by that point. And um, <clears throat> he and his son live in this little, you know, former mining town. And it, it's occupied like everywhere else. And his son is taken away and he kind of falls ass backwards into a revolution. He accidentally sparks a revolution and becomes the first feudal warlord of the Appalachian Mountains. That's, cool. that's a lot of fun. It's it's a really fun story. It's, it's meant to kind of, I mean, the subtext... <laughs> If you can even call it subtext, it's the text is um, to uh, kind of shine a light on the political divisions that were that were just starting to get really deep back then. Yeah, getting started, and look where we are now. Jesus is yeah, uh, I know. a little tamer. Uh, ask is about uh, what does the military think of your comic book writing? Do they know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're they're, they're right. well aware. I guess they wouldn't. They would know now if they didn't before. But yeah, they've they've been. <laughs> Yeah, turn the thing off. Yeah, they've been they've been great. They've been really supportive. Exactly. Um, they, yeah. I mean, I have to um, ask permission sometimes to do something like they've. Um, I have to take leave to to do signings or conventions or whatever. Yeah. But I try not to to miss you know legit work. Like I have to miss rehearsals sometimes, but I, I try not to miss like an actual you know performance or or um, any kind of official duty thing. Um, but they've always been really great. And in fact, I got to do the, the DC writers workshop early on. Um, I'd already done one book at DC by that point. I had done an Aquaman. What, what started out as a two issue Aquaman inventory thing. For those who don't know, DC does these inventory issues where, I mean, DC has got to have, you know, there's got to be a Justice League book on the shelf every month. Every month. Know, or high water. So if the creative team falls behind or if something happens, um, they yeah. want, yeah, they want spare stuff to, that yeah. they can plug in in case of emergency, you know, in between arcs or whatever they need to do. So they try to have a couple of couple of books in the can. So I wrote um, as kind of a – it's very commonly kind of a tryout thing where if if editors like a certain creator, be like, hey, would you want to do an inventory for us? Kind of see how the process goes. And that's how I started at DC. Brian Cunningham, who was at Justice League at the time as an editor, um, reached out. He liked Last God – excuse me, he liked um, Last Sons of America. And uh, we did two issues of Aquaman that ended up becoming an Aquaman, an Aquaman annual um, a couple of years ago. And um, around the same time, we got an opportunity to be part of the writer's workshop. Brian was like, you got to think about doing the writer's workshop. It'd be, it'd, you know, show your work to more editors here. I was like, I don't think I can do it because it's the writer's workshop was a, a weekly class that you did with Scott Snyder um, wow. every Wednesday for two or three hours um, for like 13 weeks or something. Wow. And I was like, and you know, pre COVID we we tour a lot and I was gonna, yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, no way can I make every week. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't even consider putting in for it. Cause like, I just don't see that working out, but he was like, no, put in like though, if you got to miss one, they'll work around it. And so I, um, I worked, I worked out the math. I was like, if I, if they let me miss one class, I think I can do it. And, but I, I still had to get out of, one concert as well at work. And so I, I didn't like, I really don't like asking off for stuff like that, but I, I did ask, I was like, Hey, I have this opportunity to do this really cool thing at DC. And they were like, 
do it. It's totally fine. I mean, we have people missing things for, you know, weddings or, or whatever. Um, they were so cool about it. Very supportive. So, um, and actually lately, Big Army, like not just my unit, but like capital A Army has been really interested in my work and has been trying to tell people about like, we've got this guy in the army that, that writes goddamn comic books <laughs> and, yeah. and has uh, has this whole other career that he enjoys. Um, basically trying to tell people, you don't have to give up who you are and join. You know, like if you want to, if you want to be in the army, you can still do the things that you love. And there's other people that do this kind of thing too, that do, that have a, you know, that um, are in culinary arts or they have a, podcast they take very very seriously or some other kind of a business or or um um competitive whatever you know like there's all these things that they do outside of their of their job that makes up who they are and the army is very interested in telling those stories and so mine has been one of those that's excellent and i'm not surprised and i that's where i was kind of going asking you about that i think that's wonderful and and again yeah it kind of shows the new attitude of the army that yeah you can like you said be who you are and yeah, literally be all you can be. That's fantastic. That's, that's the, right. Exactly. That's the slogan, man. There it was. This, it was. Yeah. I believe now it's the uh, slogan, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they've. It's the. It was. It's been Army Strong for a while, and now let's see. Yes. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> you know, I, I, you'll forgive me, but as a broadcaster, we would get so many syndicated programs, and the military, all all branches, just spend a ton of advertising on. I mean, I worked at rock stations. So a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, you know, for, you know, hey, here's a concert. It's you too. And there'd be these army commercials or there'd be Navy commercials or whatever. So I, I, and I would have to kind of take them from being so blandly syndicated and kind of customize them so they'd sound more like a local product. Sure. You know, the station and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, man, no, I, I've heard many, many a military uh, advertisement and stuff. So I'm and sure. my, my older brother was uh, was a Navy guy. As oh, well. cool! Right on. Stuff, yeah, yeah. So no, man, I, I think it's I think it's great, and it's it makes sense that they would kind of lean and say, "Hey, look again, like you said, look what this guy's doing, and he's still giving us his, his military career." How many years have you been in? Fifteen. Wow, that's great. Man. <laughs> I know it's been Gee. a minute. Wow, yeah, it's been a minute. Holy shit, that's that's fantastic, man. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, that I I really think that's that's amazing. I think you're the first career military guy. That's doing comics. I mean, certainly we had our World War II veterans, and you've got the Kirby's and the like. That right, Stanley, obviously as well. You know, I need I need to double check, but I I did some looking around, and I think when I got the Superman job, um, I was so stoked, and I um I looked at I don't think anyone else has written Superman while active duty since Jerry Siegel, which was yeah super cool because they they drafted him. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not the authority that you are or like, you know, like Paul Levis or whatever can speak more to this kind of thing. But um, he was drafted. Well, he'd already created Superman and then got drafted after that. But he still had books coming out. And I I think his name is still on those books for a while. And his job in the Army, he was primarily a writer. He was writing for Stars and Stripes um, wow. in Hawaii, I think. Yeah. I think he was stationed in Honolulu. Wow. Um, and I want to say he was still sending in scripts during that time. I think you're right. And also, um, I know, uh, I only know, and again, I only know this because I watched the DC 75th anniversary documentary, but the writer that created the original Sandman, the Golden Age Sandman, mm -hmm. I know was killed in World War II. And I can't remember oh which my God. was in, but it's amazing. His handful of eight page stories were what uh, Matt Wagner adapted for Sandman Mystery Theater and turned into the longer mm -hmm. arcs and stuff like that. And I just love that connection. And that's one of the reasons why I loved that amazing uh, series, Sandman Mystery Theater, back in the 90s. I don't know if you've ever read that. Um, no, I don't think I have, actually. I'm sorry to say. No worries. I mean, it's it's very Vertigo-esque. And it's, it's great because it's pre-Golden uh, Age Superman. And literally, like they make Wesley Dodds, the original Sandman, like one of the original costume heroes. And at the mm. time, only the Crimson Avenger was also around in that, in this kind of reconfiguration of the golden age. And yeah. it's, it's terrific. It's excellent. Um, oh, that's funny. All right, Ed, I didn't see that. I guess. Uh, I saw that. The guy, he threw up the, the new yeah, army slogans. Yeah. 
Warriors wanted what's your warrior. That's fantastic. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You're correct, Ed. Thank you. I forgot about that. That's that's great. Um, no, man. And again, uh, back to uh, what you're doing right now on the comic book side. You got a Batman thing coming up. I do. Yeah. The um, they have started up coming out of uh, death metal. Um, one of the cooler things that came out of of the original metal series I liked a lot was Tales of the Dark Multiverse. So those stories were really cool. Um, of course, you know, metal introduces the dark multiverse, like these these kind of twisted mirror versions of of the multiverse worlds that we've seen. Yeah. And um, it just opened up this whole new pop. When I when I read that in the original, I was like, oh my god, all the things I would love to do. Like it just started. You start thinking about all these new opportunities to tell awesome stories. <clears throat> and um, I mean, at the time, I was thinking more of all these other. I was thinking of the Dark Knights that come out of that story, and all these other twisted Batman that could be out there and ones that I would love to do. And then they start telling some of those. And there was the great Batman one that Kyle Higgins and Scott did. Um, and they did the, the crisis book and those were great. So uh, coming out of death metal, they wanted to do more. And um, they re Dave, let's see Dave Walgas and Ben Abernathy reached out to me about doing um the, the first one of this batch, the uh, the Batman one. So they were doing a spinoff of um, Batman Hush, like a darker version of Batman Hush. And it was, I was so stoked to do that. I mean, was, when that book was coming out, I didn't see it until I got back into comics, but Jim Lee on Batman was such a cool thing. I grew up reading him on X-Men. So seeing Jim Lee do Batman and Jeff Loeb, of course, was such a such a cool book. So doing a new take on that now, um, the take that we're that we're um, doing with Batman Hush is we're seeing a world where there's never, imagine the Gotham where there's never been a Batman uh, and we're up to present day and imagine all the events that we've seen in Gotham that Batman has been there to deal with. Imagine them happening without Batman there. Um, so we're seeing a Batman now with, excuse me, we're seeing a Gotham with no Batman and then suddenly Batman appears. Uh, what would happen? So we're seeing Thomas Elliot from Hush in a very different context. We're seeing Batman in a different context. We don't know who he is. We're seeing a world where, you know, the Court of Owls and Ra's al Ghul's plans for Gotham and um, No Man's Land, all that stuff happened without Batman being around. So what would that world look like? It's kind of a, like a wonderful, what, uh, a wonderful life set up, but in Gotham and super dark. Yeah, man. No, this is honestly, uh, I missed, Elseworlds kind of, I think, ran away from its original concept. And we were really getting like, all right, it's Batman and the Civil War. That's really all the difference. It's like, all right, you know, like, slow down. It's like, let's, you know, <laughs> let's, let's wait for the good ideas. And I do think that metal and death metal have given us this opportunity to really do explore these ideas and stuff. So that sounds great. When, when does uh, that come out? Uh, November. Uh, the exact date escapes me, but it's it's coming out in November. Okay, we're getting uh, interesting comments from around the world and uh, greetings from Chile. I oh, think great! Excellent Superman and especially Batman from his old works. That's awesome. Oh man, thanks so much, Victor. I appreciate that. Absolutely, man. That's cool. You well, judge I, judge me on on my own merit here soon. That's awesome, man. No, I'm I'm really excited. What you know? Again, um, so so how many years have you been writing DC stuff now? Um, the Aquaman came out, I want to say in 2018. I, I wrote it, I wrote it, I would have written it in 2017 because it sat in the can for a little while before they actually used it. Okay. But, uh, I want to say 2018, it, it hit shelves. So yeah. And then I did a few, um, anthology stories and, okay. um, and now this Batman thing. So yeah. No, I don't know. And again, especially at that <clears throat> level of, of writing. And I, I don't mean that in a condescending way, no. but, I, but I'm interested in uh, DC pre and post Dan DiDio. And if you've noticed any changes uh, with the projects you've gotten, and is there, I mean, and I'm not looking for dirt. I'm, what I'm looking for is there any sort of different editorial idea or direction? And again, I'm not, I, I'm not looking for spoilers or anything like that, but just kind of a general sense working in the company how things have changed. Honestly, I, I, I hate to not answer questions and I'm, so I'm going to be very honest here. I, um, yeah, I have seen change. I, I mean, it's during, during Dan's time, I'm told, um, he was very, 
involved in a lot of the stories that were told. And he had, he had such a strong passion for DC stories, for DC characters. He just loved DC books like nobody I've ever met or heard of. Um, <clears throat> and he was very, he has very strong opinions about how stuff should be and was very involved in the, in the editorial process for it too. He just, he wanted to know what everyone was doing and yeah. uh, really wanted to, to, you know, shepherd all those characters himself. And now there's, um, it seems like everyone in the editorial offices and the creators as well have been kind of creatively, like there's just a lot more creative sharing between the different departments and between the editors and the creators. And everyone just seems really um, just invigorated. And there's just all this creativity happening right now. Um, it's more just, what's the word? Um, it's not exactly like they were fettered before, but now they are just really trying stuff out, I guess, is the word. Like there, there's a lot of creativity and experimentation happening and a lot of ideas. You know, as you know, Dan was very involved in um, in 5G and yes. I'm, I can't say firsthand. I'm told he was kind of the driving force behind, behind 5G. Um, and for, for viewers who don't know, um, 5G was in theory going to be this thing where the, t the timeline <clears throat> was kind of like splintered and Wonder Woman was a character who was going to appear in the World War One era. And that was like her time. And like, that's when she was around and then Justice Society comes and then Batman, Superman. I'm not sure exact. I'm not sure the exact, you know, calendar of how it would have played no, out, but like you're, you're the big, the like, big, Totems, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, here's where Batman Superman showed up. And after they were around, then Justice League happened. And then this other thing happened. And now here's Flash. And now in modern day, Batman Superman are now older. Now we have new Batman Superman. Or maybe that would be in the future. I'm not sure. And that's so everyone, you wouldn't be seeing Batman because, you know, in the real life, of course, Batman showed up in the 30s. And now, you, you know, he's still around right now. So you've got to do some retconning or some massaging of, of timelines. And post 5G, that would have all gone away. And it would have been like, here's when Wonder Woman was in her prime. Here's when she becomes a you know, goddess or whatever. And that would have been very set, you know? That is, you know, that all changed. And there, but there were all these great ideas. And again, I'm, I'm talking, I was not, I didn't have a seat at that table. I'm, I'm still kind of the new guy. So I don't really, if I'm, uh, if I'm getting anything wrong or, or right, it's, it's purely because I'm just kind of speculating. Um, but there were so many great ideas that came out of that um, that we wanted to explore. And so we're doing some of that with Future State and other things will be will be explored down the road. Um, some things that you'll see in my in my Superman worlds or a worlds of war story were things that we had talked about um, potentially spinning out of 5G. So now it's just a very different scene. It's a very different uh, way of exploring the stories. It's all very free to experimentation and just trying things out and having a, a great time telling great stories with new creators. Well, you know, and honestly, this sounds very much like what was happening with the Ultimate Universe, you know, 20 and, and 15 years ago, and then even 10 years ago, introducing somebody like Miles Morales. And, you know, there there is a possibility that the right story will click and maybe we will see a new Batman alongside uh, Bruce Wayne because I think, and again, this is all me saying this now. I always have to, I just got to put the, the qualifier on that. I don't want to speak for Philip. I'm speaking for myself. But um, what 5G was introduced, I think the concern was from readers was, wait a minute, y you know, you can't fight the world. I mean, Clark Kent is Superman. Bruce Wayne is Batman. You know, you can introduce new people, but really at the end of the day, don't you want, you know, whatever the, the zeitgeist of the public is. Again, in, using the example of Peter Parker and Miles Morales, there's room for both. And it's really been this amazing, I think, uh, revelation of anyone can be Spider-Man. And that was always existing with, with Peter Parker. But I think Miles really reinforced that idea and both can represent Spider-Man in their own way. So it's good to hear that what was planned for 5G has morphed into Future State. And I think it's a great story opportunity alongside the continuing adventures of, you know, everybody right now. I mean, I'm going to talk to James Tynan uh, next week. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Bruce Wayne's going through a lot of crazy stuff right now. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how, how long that status quo changes. 
Brian Bettis obviously revealing, God, it's almost been a year now since Clark had revealed his identity and Brian's yeah. wrapped his run on Superman. It's going to be interesting to see what sticks and what doesn't. I mean, and yeah. again, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting. The stuff that I do in worlds of war is, I mean, spins completely out of what Bendis did with, with, with his uh, Superman run. So like the, especially the Clark Kent revelation, we're going to see, we're not just going to be seeing Clark in space. We're also going to be seeing earth. We're going to be seeing Smallville specifically as well. Like what, you know, what is the world like? What does Smallville look like after the reveal? Superman's, yeah. The reveal. Yeah. Like years down the road. That's cool. That's fantastic. It's, it's cool. It's really cool following Bendis, man. Like it's, it's just like just for Worlds of War, but it's having read his work, you know, doing reading New Avengers when I got back into um, comics again was so awesome. I wasn't really reading Avengers back in the day. And so getting to know these characters. So, you know, basically through New Avengers and then kind of catching up, you know, on what had come before that was really great. I really love his writing. Powers was another one of the things that I discovered early on when I got back into it. And um, so boning up on all of his Superman work to get ready for Worlds of War was really, really fun and rewarding. That's cool. And now, and again, as a younger reader than me, younger than me, certainly, <laughs> uh, you know, I, when I grew up, in fact, in fact, Mark Miller and I were just talking about this in the previous hour um, about growing up and, and we would read those hundred page spectaculars from the seventies that would yeah. have a front brand new story, but also would have, stories from the silver age and even the golden age and stuff. So, I mean, I, I read some of those too. I know it was like technically before my time, but I, um, but I mean, my first DC comics were, were second and third hand. Like dad would come home with boxes and ripped up books. Sure. And so I'm reading some of these really old, you know, I had, I had tons and tons of Kurt Swan stuff and that's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was cool. So like, you'd, like you'd see the, yeah. Batman family, whatever, and it was like a, a bunch of books together, or this or the spectacular books that you're talking about. Yep. So and it's kind of yep. cool to be doing like the Worlds of War is going to be very much like those old, you know, the Batman family or World's Finest, the things where it's you'll see you get a Batman story, but also another one of Batgirl fighting, you know, Benedict Arnold or whatever, you know, yeah. and Robin fighting whoever. Like you, all these these different chapters. This is uh, Worlds of War is very much like that, where you're going to get stories of of Clark, but also Another one of Guardian and another one of um, Mr. Miracle wow. and another one of, you know, Supergirl so, or whoever. So Guardian, again, this is a future story. So is this a new Guardian? Yes. Wow. That's yeah. great. Now, I'm assuming you're not writing that feature. It's I'm not doing that one. That one, I believe, is Sean Kelly. Oh, you, right. uh, Sean, oh, shit. Sean Lewis. God, I'm, okay. I'm, the, I'm the worst. No, 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 and I'm and I'm you know catching you on the spot and everything. No, it's cool. No, but I am. I'm I'm fascinated by this idea, and also getting back to uh, the the Bronze Age stuff you might have read, and even maybe Silver Age stuff. Um, I, I you know one of my favorite writers of of Superman was Elliot Magan, and he was a big. He and Carrie Bates were kind of the two, and Marty Pasco too. Shame on me. Oh yeah, friend, yeah. My dear friend that uh, passed away this year, but I love that era of Bronze Age stories. And it's funny when you said that we're going to see what Smallville is like in the future. Um, uh, Elliot wrote these two incredible paperback novels, and they're actually available now. One is called Last Son of Krypton, and one is called Miracle Monday. And they were made around the time of the um, Richard Donner, Christopher Reeve first movie. Oh, sweet. And um, yeah, because at first they were hoping to get the, do the adaptation like movies always did and still do for that matter. But um, there was some sort of rights issue that they couldn't do it. So Elliot instead was commissioned to write two original Superman novels. And they're set in the Bronze Age. And it's so fantastic because it's it's the Daily Planet with Steve Lombard and, and Jimmy and Lois and everybody. And it's it's hilarious. It's it's fantastic. And it's great because it really was this adult, not adult in a salacious way, but it was meant to be a mass paperback for adults to read. Huh. And it's great. It's outstanding. There's another one. Tom, De I want to say Tom DeHaven was the guy who wrote it, and it's called It's Superman, and it's kind of a Superman year one, and it's set in 1938. Oh, and wow. Okay. It's a great novel, and you really get inside Superman's head. So it's just, I was wondering if any other sort of past Superman writings, you know, have you've come across that may be informed, you know, how you see what's going on in Superman's head. Um, the biggest, well, as far as who Superman is and what's going on in his head, I would credit some newer versions where it's um, not new, new, but 
Um, I really love Mark Wade's take on the character. Um, his stuff just has, I mean, you get this, when you watch the Christopher Reeve movies, you just get this feeling, you know, like I, at least I did. Um, maybe it's just because I'm, you know, my, my age when I was watching it. But, you know, as a little kid watching Superman and seeing the credits roll over my head and the, that music is playing and Christopher Reeve is just, he just exudes Superman. That that to me is who Superman is. He just always does the right thing, and it's not just about his power that he wields. It's about the compassion he shows people, and like how he the kindness he treats everyone with. And even with the bad guys, he's firm, but he's not a jerk. You know, I don't know. He's just so true, and he's just the best. Um, and Mark Wade, uh, Mark Wade's voice on Superman kind of captures that too. I love him on Kingdom Come, but I also love him in um, Oh my God, the one where he goes to Africa. What's that? arc. Uh, yeah, Birthright is so great. Um, as far as my take on Worlds of War, I was actually very inspired by Superman 400, that uh, the anthology from, from way back, actually, which I have right next to me here. <laughs> I've been looking over this. Um, Superman 400 um, is this anthology of stories by various creators. There's also a lot of single images, like covers inside the inside the, like pinups inside the book there's one by um i guess frank miller did a story in there there was a steve ditko pinup there's a mobius pinup um let's see there's i think shaking to the cover it's an amazing book and oh yeah even as the kid as a kid reading it when you're used to seeing comics in kind of the house style where everything looks not the same to the trained eye but to a kid there's you have a kind of a an art style you expect to see and um that book completely turned that on its head and every story looked wildly different. I think the same writer wrote them all, but they, um, but they feel all, every story was very, felt very different. And uh, the art styles were all, every take was just such a different thing. This is Superman from different periods of time. You see him way in the future. You'd see him in the past. You see people's takes on him. Um, it was just, I think I heard actually I heard Bendis describe it as like Superman as art, you know, and that's yes. that was my that was my first time seeing Superman as art in a way that was different than what I was used to seeing, you know, it was like a like a an art house kind of story. And Worlds of War, there's a there's a thing in there that very much pays homage to Superman 400, where you see what Superman means to to other people, to different people. Exciting, man! That's fantastic, and yes, I I agree with you. I think that's really a great landmark uh, comic. And uh, and I believe, and if, forgive me, because I heard you uh, saying these the, the the creators that were involved. Did you mention Storenko? I did not mention it, but I do remember that pick that pick that was in there. Yeah, yeah, that was that was <laughs> that's right, that's right. It was a picture. I mean, you oh know, wait, or did he, no? He drew. Did he draw the last story? Like there was there was I, one there was there one was one that was, was right really there. kind of abstract. And I thought that was the Storenkos. Oh, there you go. You got it right there, Adam Boy. Gonna, we're going to solve oh, you this are right killing now. Me. I'm going to I'm going to uh, throw up a couple uh, comments that people are saying right now. Elliot Smagan's Kingdom Come novelization is top notch. So good, added detail to the world. I completely agree. And some of these new Superman DC Future State books, in addition to the monthly miniseries and one shots, are being classified as oversized. Is that in scale format or length? Um. I'm sorry. Can you throw that up? One oh, time? sure. They're it. wondering, I guess, uh, that the 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 books are going to be oversized, the future state books, yes. and it's not. They're not going to be treasury editions. They're going to be uh, anthologies. As to my describing. to my knowledge, the format is not going to be larger, like oversized. I think it's right. going to be like longer page count. I don't. Um, however, I could I could be wrong, but I is I I've not heard anything right. about it being larger. No, I think I think that's exactly it. And you're right. So, that was the Storanko. Yes. Yes, and it's so funny. Yeah, exactly. And you see, so. you see Superman, like, and basically, it's like a House of L thing, where you see, yeah, you see where his line goes for you know the centuries that follow. Absolutely, how how, um, how his legacy becomes the legacy of mankind. It's really cool. Superman is art. Absolute description. Phil, we're we're under the gun for time, so I'm going to wrap up and thank you very much. Uh, very excited about Superman Future State. Very excited about what you're doing with Marvel Zombies wrapping up in November and whatever this mysterious other uh, horror project oh, you man. coming up for Marvel. Can't wait to talk about it, man. It's always a pleasure to see you. Well, then we'll be talking about it on Word Balloon in, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And uh, as oh. always, great, great chatting with you. Thank you very much for your time. You too, John. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Bye.
Oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. Philip Kennedy Johnson. I just want to point out at the top of the hour, uh, we're going to have Terry Moore. And that's going to be a great conversation with Terry Moore and Amy Dallin. Then right after that, a great one-on-one -on -one with Louise Simonson and Christy Blanche. Looking forward to that conversation. Spies Like Comics following that at 4 Eastern. Great look at spy comic books. My buddy Rob Meyer Burnett will be moderating that. And then 5 o'clock, Valiant, uh, Exo Man of War with Dennis Hallen telling us about his plans for Exo Man of War. Then we got the Ringo red carpet from 6 to 8. And the Ringo Awards tonight featuring Kevin Smith and Jeff Johns and a host of others. I hope you'll join us. Stick around. Make sure you check the schedule, BaltimoreComicConLive.com, and check out the panels you want. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up. Thanks a lot, everybody, for watching. Everybody take care. We'll see you on the next panel. I'm doing very soon.